Hi all, um, for those that don't know, I'm Cressida Hall, I'm the General Manager of AIMA and I'd like to welcome to you, you to this um, extraordinary webinar we're having. Um, I'm just going to take you through a couple of housekeeping issues. The first one is that at the bottom of your screen there is a question and answer tab and you can use that to submit questions throughout the um, webinar. There's also a chat um, facility on the right, please use that, there's often a lively chat that happens there and we're really privileged to have Penny Caldercott as our doctor on that chat today. And so having said that, I'm going to hand over to Penny Caldercott, who's the president of AMA, who will do a brief introduction to today's webinar. So enjoy. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on this Tuesday afternoon or evening if you're in New Zealand. Um, I think it's going to be a great session today. Um, I'm just going to say a couple of things about AMA because I suspect that some of you are members of AMA and some of you aren't. And so some of you might not know much about who we are and what we do. So um, AMA is uh, the peak body for integrative medicine in both Australia and New Zealand and maybe further than that in the future because uh, we're the Australasian integrative medicine body. Um, and we do lots of different things. So as the peak body, we do advocacy. We do um, advocacy at a government level. Um, and this year in Australia, we had a meeting with Greg Hunt, talking to him about integrative medicine, what a big role we should be playing in chronic disease prevention and management. Um, but we've also, as you, some of you know, last year did a lot of work with, um, around the Medical Board of Australia's new proposed guidelines for integrative and complementary medicine. We're also setting up a whole suite of resources for advocacy for doctors in Australia in particular, um, because integrative medicine doctors don't have another group who do advocacy for them. Um, so we, we now actually have a group of lawyers. Um, we're setting up resources in terms of preparing um, preparing yourself to practice in a way that, that keeps you and, and your patients safe, but also um, mentoring by both lawyers and um, experienced doctors who've had their own challenges. Um, we're doing some work around communication between practitioners. Um, you can see our website for that. So we've set up a, a, um, a course that helps people to do referral letters to each other so that we can really work integratively. We're setting up a consumer integrative medicine group um, and an IM fellowship. Um, so there's quite a, quite a lot of things that we're doing at the moment. So I guess watch this space and, um, and certainly um, become a member of our organisation or jump in and, and help us out with some things. So I'd like to um, open this webinar today. So as you know, this is the big picture about COVID-19 and what, and what kinds of things that this is really making us look at and reevaluate. Um, in our world and certainly I'm hearing from young people that that this virus has really you know changed a lot of things but actually what are we doing about climate change because that seems to be an even more important topic than this virus for many young people um, but anyway I'm sorry I'm not going to start talking about the topic because it's not my job so we've got two wonderful um, people to talk to us today and that's Tim Ewer uh, Tim Ewer is an integrative medicine doctor from New Zealand. Um, he was physician trained in the UK and has been practicing integrative medicine in New Zealand for a long time. He also does a lot of education and does some amazing things in, in his practice um, and has a real interest in big picture. And Jimmy Wallumban, I've um, just learnt to pronounce his name properly who's also a wonderful man who is, I think, originally trained in traditional Chinese medicine. Yes, he's nodding his head. Um, but he's also looked at lots of uh, practices of um, indigenous medicines all over the world. Um, and so I suspect his, his practice is, is um, Chinese medicine and much more. But he's also an amazing educator and speaker and has set up a, a, an organisation called One Health which helps to finance health products, uh, health products, health, uh, um, uh, what's my, the right word, all kinds of health projects all over the world. And I think also some microfinancing for health projects. Um, so I will just hand over to Jimmy and Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Penny. Um, maybe I can um, get the ball rolling. Um, first of all, thank you for the introductions. Um, 
before we go further, I thought it might be nice to just set the scene of where we've been so far, because uh, we've had six webinars so far through AMA around the COVID subject. And um, some of them have been about um, the aspects of the science of it. Some have been about how to help the immune system through nutrition, through herbs. Um, also how to help ourselves in terms of our social and psychological needs with Patria King. So, and uh, another one that we had more recently about some of the controversies about the, perhaps the origin and the treatment of COVID. And that's kind of been the background of where we've got to. But I think today's session, which I'm really looking forward to, is about opening up this picture and starting to uh, look at what are the wider horizons uh, out there so that um, we can look at perhaps how we as um, human beings are and our society and what we've done to the planet has impacted in a way that is related to this present pandemic and also what lessons we can learn from it that may be able to help us going down this same um, cyclic line of either infections or other catastrophes in the future. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jimmy, who I know is a wonderfully passionate and highly informed individual and has the wonderful kind of helicopter vision, as they say in business, I believe. I'm not a business person, but if you're a helicopter person, that's what you do. And say, Jimmy, hey, where do you want to start on this particular journey tonight? And we'll see where it takes us. Well, I, I thought the first place to start was just perhaps just with integrative medicine, um, you know, before we jump into it um, more deeply is that to me, integrative medicine is um, definitely a lot more than just integrating new pills into your um, practice, right? You know, suddenly using vitamins alongside um, uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, it's uh, at one level, it's about integrating your practice with a whole range of other services. But at the highest level, I think integrative medicine is about uh, thinking in an integrative manner. And, um, and that uh, means that as healthcare providers, we see ourselves uh, in the broader context. And so it's not just about clinical practice of medicine, but it's um, about the way in which the clinical practice of medicine has to integrate with public health and that health as a whole integrates with the economy, uh, the environment and politics, because as we've really learned through public health, there can be no health in an unhealthy culture. And all of those things are the social determinants of health that we're very, very familiar with. So I think as integrative practitioners, it's really important uh, that we contribute to the bigger, the, big, the larger dialogue. And I think that's a, a perhaps a place where uh, physicians once really excelled at uh, in the 1970s uh, and with, with Dr. Mahler at the head of the WHO, uh, physicians were leading the charge for creating a healthy world that worked for everyone. And lately it feels like physicians have uh, stepped back, medical practitioners have stepped back and have commenting more in a clinical sphere. And I think it's a really good opportunity for us with COVID to have a conversation that goes outside uh, uh, the clinical considerations. So, so when you say clinical, um, Jimmy, uh, are you meaning within the kind of context of just the one-on-one -on -one uh, relationship or are you talking about the bigger um, primary, secondary type clinical situation? I'm, um, I'm talking about, um, yeah, not the, the treatment of our individual patients and clients that we come across and not even healthcare policy per se as to, you know, how we should triage or, you know, what the, the, what the response should be specifically to this uh, pandemic. I think um, personally, I, I, I think that wonderful thing about health is that it puts a human face on the way in which the culture is not whole. I say that again, it puts a human face on the way in which the culture is not whole. And so when you see, uh, you know, images of, uh, you know, in the 1980s of, you know, African babies in sub-Saharan area, then 
then, then we see this starvation, but behind that is a whole series of economic realities and, you know, third world debt and all these sort of things. And so it, it really puts a face, a human face on that. And it allows us to catalyze the appropriate changes that are necessary to create a healthy culture. And as public health has shown us, is this like, if as in clinical medicine, we're just picking, if we've got an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and we're just picking up people that an unhealthy culture is spitting over the edge of that cliff, then sooner or later as physicians, we, we say, well, this is not enough. You know, we can't be an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. And so to not be an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff at times means to put down the clinical lens and to contribute as healthcare practitioners to the broader discussion. And so the broader discussion to me is, um, is, is Penny, men Penny mentioned uh, climate change. And, um, and, and one of the pieces that we have to really contextualize COVID-19 with is not, not just contextualize it with climate change, but say it is climate change. And so our disease ecologists, those that study uh, diseases and their relationship to the environment have quietly amassed an enormous amount of data over the last 30 years. And it's, 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 it's foolish to argue with. And they've shown essentially the emergence of a novel disease every year for the last three decades. And one of the primary drivers of all of that is climate change. And so we change the migratory patterns of animals. We deforest an area and the mosquitoes move into a new zone. Um, we have, uh, we have all, all of these things that virilize and change pathogens and the biosphere responds, right? The, the bacteria respond, they adapt and the viruses respond and they adapt. And as they respond and adapt faster than us, <laughs> then when we encounter that response and adaption, we call it disease, right? And so it's, in, 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 and, and for us it is, <laughs> as we struggle to respond and adapt. But initially, we have to very much see the emergence of novel diseases in the context of the major environmental destruction that is happening across the planet. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, that's great. And uh, that kind of sets the scene. And I, I kind of think what you're getting to is that we have, as, as, a, as a human species in the last 50 or more years done a huge amount of damage to the planet, which has upset a lot of um, ecosystems. And those we're part of ecosystems. And now we're kind of getting a taste of how the disruption of those ecosystems can actually start affecting us. Um, and that to, 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 to look too much from a simply individual perspective for the person in front of me is not going to address the larger questions which you're coming to, I think. Is that what Absolutely. we're going to? Absolutely, is that we, we know it's not enough just to get, uh, it's not enough, to, it's not enough just to get, um, you know, better medicines for diabetics, right? It's not enough. We can't just get better medicine for diabetics. When we've got this epidemic of diabetes going across the planet, is that, well, we need to address that. We need to address a whole range of different things to try and stop diabetes, because diabetes is preventable. So getting, you know, herbs for diabetes integrated with, you know, metformin and insulin, it's still an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. It's good. It's an important step. But actually, we don't want to, we need to stem that tide. And so, it's the same with the, the re-emergence of infectious diseases, right? And so, the epidemiological transition, so that term, you know, that we've all learned in the past, epidemiological transitions, that we went through a transition from hunter-gatherer and we entered into the, you know, the, the period of pestilence and famine, which is all the agricultural period when all these diseases really kind of emerged. We lived close to animals. We got monoculture diets. We lived close to each other in our waste, you know, and all these sort of diseases all blossomed that weren't really there prevalent in a prevalent form in the past. Then we got the Industrial Revolution and it got steam-powered and it just went through the roof because we got, you know, that 80 percent, all the overcrowding and all the, the, man, the, the things that happened there. Now, what turned that around, we know, we all know what turned that around is not medicine. It wasn't medical reforms largely between 1830 and, you know, 1890 that stemmed all those diseases in the past. It was social reform. You know, we got good, clean water. We got a democracy. Sanitation. 
we got sanitation. Yeah. We started washing our hands. Mm. We got off diets of potatoes alone. We got the mm. terrible overcrowding that taken place and we got basic equality starting to come in. I mean, we didn't even have a democracy, right? You know, we didn't even have a democracy. 1838, the Chartists at this point. And so we changed the social environment radically and before even sulfonamides come on the, onto the scene in medicine, right, in the 30s, in the 1910, 1920, we see this plummeting line of infectious diseases changing because we changed the larger environment. And previously, we were mismanaging the larger environment. Now, ecologically, that was the case, coal fumes in the air and, you know, pollution in the water. But we were mismanaging the social and the economic, the industrial, as well as the ecological environment. And then we did those broad reforms, right? And that was so important. We got the, the poverty acts and the public health acts. We got schooling, we got education, we got children out of factories. And so today we're seeing an emergence of, first off, we saw all the chronic diseases and we've been looking at that and wrestling with that. But as we know that there's this, a, a rising tide coming, the re-emergence, the end of the antibiotic era and the re-emergence of infectious diseases as we've mismanaged the environment again. And so I think that lens is really, really important. I just want to take a breath there and see how I'm doing in, in articulating that picture about the role of, of how those epidemics change according to the broader social environment. Yeah, I think that that's a great way of sort of painting the, the initial kind of industrial revolution on particularly, but obviously right through from agri agricultural revolution onwards too. What do you think about the idea of the virus as a meta-organism and uh, how that fits into this picture? Um, well, perhaps just, um, just a step down, uh, a step, I'm not sure. Where I would like to go with that question is that the, 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 is that the most exciting um, information I've seen about viruses is, um, is you know, when, when, when I first learned about viruses, as I'm sure was the same for you, there's this sort of like, oh, well, they're just dumb pieces of DNA and do we even classify them as being alive, you know? Like, they don't even have a cell, la, la, la. That was how I learnt about viruses. And recently, we've, uh, through computer models, uh, at the assistance of computer models, but also gene sequencing, we've realised that we were looking in the wrong way. And this is the case in so many areas, is that we were looking too close we needed to get a minifying glass and step back. And that viruses need to be understood as swarm organisms. And we can't look at the single unit, right? It's, it's like a form of systems biology almost in that regard. We can't look at a single unit because then you don't see the forest for the trees. And so we see them as these, the term is mutant swarm. And so any single virus by itself is like a leaf on a tree or even an ant in an ant's nest or a cell in the human body by itself it doesn't represent what that organism is. But the larger organism is constantly spitting out mutations, potentially one mutation per replication, a range of research says, right? And so all, it's got all of these mutations so that it can be, it's got, it's ready to respond to whatever ch changes in the environment. But then the, the thing that I found profoundly interesting is some of the modeling of how they behave and move has likened them to top predators like tigers in ecosystems. And um, my favorite story from that is about um, uh, monkey troops that are in benignly infected in, with their virome of a particular virus, right? That's moving through obviously a range of different, uh, a range of different organisms in a particular ecosphere. And then um, through deforestation, then a, 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 a new monkey troop comes into that particular area and then, um, and through the pressures that happen with those competing overcrowded monkeys, then the, the virus um, uh, virilizes and the particular strains that were quite dormant in the original stable ecology go up and the invading monkey troop in this particular uh, uh, study became really quite sick and then, you know, suddenly homeostasis to the broader environment is, is returned, right? And so, they're looking at viruses in this regard as akin to behaving like top predators in this way. And I think what even, sorry. 
sorry, I, I interrupted. I, you, I did, thought you'd finished, but just carry on because I want to just ask something about it. Go on. Um, and so that's obviously a metaphor. That's an image, you know. Um, yeah. But I think the important thing is is then if that image doesn't sit with you uh, well as these kind of wrathful ecological deities, <laughs> you know, viral sort of nature spirits in some way, then what we can see instead is that well-known relationship between, uh, you know, the, 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 the germ, you know, or the virus, the host and its environment, right? The, the, that, that tri the three-legged stool we really need to look at to understand epidemics. And, um, and so we can see there's a, they're strongly environmentally determined. Therefore, we, when we change the environment in Wuhan or in China or in a range of different areas, up through placing pressure on bat colonies that then change their migration or human individuals that then can't hunt what they previously hunted and then start consuming something else, or you know, a range of different measures, then we see a response. The environment changes, the virome, the planetary virome and the planetary probiome, the microbiome of the planet changes. That's what it just changes. It, it adapts. And, um, and that's the beautiful modeling. I think that we need to keep in mind whilst we're looking at COVID-19. What uh, great. What in terms of, um, the virus as its own sort of society, and yet our, our society, we see a lot of separation and fragmentation. How do you think that part in our society plays into this? Um, well, the thing that, um, there's, a, there's, a, anyone, there's a beautiful and complex discussion that takes place in evolutionary biology um, that uh, a range of people will be familiar with. Richard Dawkins and others have touched upon it. And it's the relationship be between genes and memes. And so um, I think this really opens up the discussion for us, right? And so memes, you know, not just cute cat videos on, on Facebook, you know, but ideas in a way, right? And, and so what that, what that means is that in, at some level, genes give rise to and determine ideas, right? And we see them emerging out of our biology. But then, then we see that nurture or society and culture then has a downward effect on biology in turn, right? And so we have ideas affecting biology, obviously. And so examples of that are that, you know, if you have an idea in a religion that, you know, uh, every woman should have three husbands. That's going to change the biology, you know, that's going to change that ecosphere quite significantly. Um, uh, there's a range of ideas that we could give in this area where memes are then exerting pressure on genes and changing the environment. So um, in this loop that takes place between genes and memes, there's a viral meme or an idea, which is the idea of modernity. And the idea of modernity is a wonderful idea in so many ways. You know, the, the core paradigm, the core gestalt, the collection of uh, perspectives that lies at the heart of what was once Western culture and is now global culture, right? Because it's a range of those things. You know, we could talk about uh, the myth of progress as one of them, right? But also aspects of mechanism or you know at times reductionism there's a lot of positive things but also the nature of economics there's a whole cluster of these that go in that define our culture as different from fifth century bc greek culture right and so that's a meme in a way but what has become really increasingly clear over the last however many decades is that there's something profoundly unhealthy or unsustainable at the very least about modernity. And so on the one hand, we have the crisp clean image of, and, and for good reason, there's a lot of things that we do really well. Our global culture at this point does really well. We've got, got a lot to be proud of. In a lot of ways, things have never been better. You know, there's a, that, that's all true. Yet, there's more and more and more people falling through the gaps and there's more and more species winking out of existence, languages winking out of existence, cultures winking out of existence, icebergs 
melting before our eyes, right? And so there's this growing sense of oh, there's something unhealthy at the heart of it. And it's really at the heart of it. And so it's not that we have an ecological problem. It's just that ecology, like medicine, puts a, a face, a face that we can relate to upon the ways in which our culture is not whole, right? It's not that we just have an economic problem or a political problem or a technological problem or a medical problem or you fill in the blanks which ones you feel like is unsustainable. Is there something deeper down there at the heart of it which is informing each one of the ways that we are doing that which is not sustainable? And that's, that's a viral meme. <laughs> But so um, I guess in one way you could say perhaps our, in terms of this modernity and the, the progress that we're pushing towards, is it based to some extent on avariciousness and greed versus a higher aspiration of, of processing? And uh, to some extent we are creating this dysfunctional process because of our desire nature. I'm going off a bit on metaphysical here, I'm afraid. Okay. Yes. Well, um, I, um, at that level, you know, there's, there's a lot of different stories that we can tell about human nature. Um, and they're all quite valid, you know, as well. And so everyone listening to us will have their story about, you know, about human nature. Some of them will be really positive and uplifting. Some of them will be really pessimistic. Um, but, um, it's at, at the very least a mixed bag, <laughs> human nature and um and i um I, i'm reminded here of the experiments um of uh on addiction called rat park and um those that don't recall this experiment it's when we looked at cocaine and rats and you give cocaine to rats and they just cope and you could give them to them on a little feeding slot and they just take cocaine and cocaine until they crawl into a little ball and they coke, coke themselves to death, right? And our theories of human nature, addiction, and a range of things were based upon these experiments. And then I forget the guy's name who came along and said, but these rats are in a very weird environment that we're doing this to. They're in a kind of rat jail. What if we made a better environment and then we offered them the cocaine and then we saw what happened? And so he built rat park and that was a place where rats who are very social animals you know they laugh in this ultrasonic thing they tickle and they've got rat morality morality they've got this all this incredible stuff like these rules about rat behavior they're mammalian and very complex social beings which is why we study them in relation to ourselves um, and when they created this rat park this happy environment and then they offered the cocaine then they used the cocaine but they didn't then they went off it and then just like well actually this is better it's better to be cuddled and snuggled and wrestling and tickling and turning around on the wheel and jumping around in my happy rat land. Now, in terms of the statement that you made before about is our unhealthy culture just due to greed? Uh, and perhaps then I, I would say an addiction to uh, money, um, prestige, uh, fame, um, consumerism, fill in the blanks, you know, and plus of a range of other addictions. Then I would say, um, I don't think that's our nature. Uh, at least that's not the part of human nature that I would like to sing up personally. I think that, that when a society starts to lose some of its, its really important things and it goes from being a, the equivalent of a rat park, a happy Disneyland for mammals to a kind of rat prison, which is aspects of the postmodern, post-industrialist era. There's aspects of it that are like that for a lot of people. Then addiction and consuming, you know, because of our low dopamine levels, you have to source it externally. You're going to source that. You've got to get your dopamine levels up somehow externally. And if that's shopping and consuming the world, so the sense of society as an addict to me is not a reflection upon something intrinsically wrong with humanity, but I think it's uh, aspects of how our culture is not whole again. And so this way in which we're kind of been hurtling towards somewhere destructive, like an addict, right? Hurtling towards somewhere more and more and more and more and more uh, is, is, is COVID is one of the points that gives us this, this 
necessity to ask ourselves, okay, what's going on? What's really going on? Great. No, I think you're right. And, and in terms of, I think part of this is the, the fact that uh, if you go through that more, that greed one, I, I agree, it's just part of us, but it's also what makes us want to consume the earth and to um, uh, not necessarily be a, um, related to our multiculturalism, which is there, but we don't necessarily acknowledge it well enough to realize we're all part of the same whole. Um, and we want to just get on and consume as best we can to some extent. And how I much is a virus doing more of the same? In a way? Yes. Well, I think in terms of um, what the a best attempt at what that viral meme is that needs to be adjusted, right? Philosophically, it's called an ont et loop, how our ontology gives rise to our epistemology and our epistemology gives rise to our ontology. And it goes around and around. It's a paradigm in a sense. What I think is uh, is fundamentally wrong there the base of all of the ways that we do ecology the way in which we do politics and economics and aspects of medicine is a fragmenting and this is why integrative medicine is important because and is 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 is, is because it's an aspect of integrative thinking and integrative thinking is what is required for us to be able to see holes again see relationships because we've seen things you know there's like we acknowledge i don't know this 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 is this bottle is a thing but a marriage isn't a thing and an ecology isn't a thing a spoon is a thing we've got a very restrictive ontology in that regard of what a thing is and when we call something a thing we say it's real right and relationships and systems are not things that we've acknowledged as things. They're kind of ephemeral, secondary, and we haven't even seen them, right? It's like we haven't seen the fascia in the body. We pride ourselves on anatomy in the West, and we missed out on this incredibly complex system, which is the fascia, the connective tissue. We haven't seen the connections. And so I think that um, the, the crack in the lens is what uh, has prevented us from being able to see the connections. And one of the things that COVID really drives home for us, right, is just that we're all in this together. It's not enough for me to lock up at home if all the people in my community are all, I don't know, running around in the middle of the epidemic, you know, having great big cuddle parties or something like that. There's, a, there's, no, there's no safety. There's no drawbridge to be brought up. And the same with, with climate change. It's like there's no, there's no separation. What's happening in the Antarctic? What's happening in sub-Saharan Africa, what's happening between America and China, what happens, you know, anywhere, what happens to the bat community in China and their viruses, it happens to all of us. That, that's the realisation. Is, is there something like that? Yeah, I, I love your enthusiasm, by the way, and you do put it together beautifully, Jimmy. Um, one of the things that um, I hear about and, and it's easy to get trapped in sometimes is a sense that that's all wonderful, but I feel pretty hopeless about what I can do about it. How, how do I empower myself or, or the, the people yes. around me? Uh, yeah, how do yeah. I take full responsibility? So again, I think that that, uh, I, first I get the hopelessness, right? And that's, that's a, it's an aspect of our generation is the sense of, uh, for a range of people uh, who feel that there's something uh, unhealthy about aspects of the way in which we're moving forward as a global culture, ecologically and otherwise, it's just like the juggernaut just drives forwards, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. It's just, what does one do in the face of, of, of all of this? These massive systems, you know, mm. and it's just... I can't, what, what am I to do? You know, what am I to do? And so I think that's, um, I think what's unhealthy there is our model of power, right? And our model of power there is a victim's model of power, firstly. <laughs> and it's uh, based upon uh, heroic notions. And so it's a heroic version of history and a heroic notion of power. And it's, it's the story that says, Hitler orchestrated World War II, 
you know, Hitler's to blame. Like he did that. Whereas a historian is going to say, well, listen, what happened in the wake of World War I was complex and blah, 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 all these things. And if you did go back in time and take Hitler out, there would have been another, you know, thousand Hitlers beside him because the causes of, the causes of World War II were complex and the same as the causes of the Industrial Revolution. You ask someone on the street and they say the steam engine. You ask a historian and they'll give you a two hour lecture that involves, you know, all the way back to the Reformation. A range of causes come together and those causes push up the institutions and the empires that we have. They create those institutions. But those, where, those, where those causes exist, the basic unit of them is in the individual. And so this is, this is what I think we forgot in the West is that the reason why we have individualism, the reason why we have human rights is not out of some sense of entitlement. It's because the salvation of society, which tends to get rigid and, 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 and problematic, lays inside sane individuals. And, 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 and they are, there's the hero's journey inside that is, that, is that either a culture emerges from uh, a range of uh, people that all share a bad idea and they, you get the politicians that you deserve, or a positive culture emerges from a range of people that all share and spread a really positive idea. And this is why Solzhenitsyn, who wrote uh, the Gulag Archipelago, after his horrendous experiences, you know, uh, through, you know, being in a, like a labor camp, you know, wasting away, he, and he asked what happened to Russia? How did we get here, right? He'd had his 911, his, his COVID-19. And he didn't come away saying, oh, look, those rotten politicians did it to us. He said, we did this. Each one of us was living a lie. And we built this culture, unhealthy culture up to the point where now it is destroying us. And so when you say I feel hopeless, then I would like to start by saying, first, remember, we, we know where power lays. It lays in ideas. And those ideas are stories that are told by individuals that are believed by individuals. Is that making sense so far or is it too abstract? And I think that's great. And I, I might, I've got a couple of questions coming up that people are putting in. So I might try and see if we can weave that into what you're just saying. Um, one is uh, how can we effectively use the wisdom of traditional medicine like Ayurveda, TCM, etc., to address these contemporary issues uh, that have arisen by, um, by not understanding the relationship between nature, the macrocosm and humans. So perhaps not quite what you were talking about, but yes. in a way, I guess it's, it's how do we take back some power through some of these kind of modalities or the integrative approach generally? Okay. Firstly, as I was saying, I personally believe the power is always there. You know? <laughs> it's always there in, the, in those ideas and in those individuals. And, and that's that, that, that sense of the macrocosm and the microcosm at the moment, we have uh, the, the beautiful story of that, which is so common to, you know, our Greek tradition and the Chinese tradition and the Ayurvedic tradition is um, seeing a commonality between, you know, the microcosm and the macrocosm. Um, and in relation to, um, you know, what's happening at the moment, then I think... <sighs> I think uh, one of the, benef the, the benefits of traditional medicine is that they remind us that, uh, that re remind us deeply of those connections. And they, they give us access through simple metaphors of saying, oh, inside your body, it's like weather patterns. It's like, you know, menopause is like a drought. And this COVID lung thing, it's, it's sort of like a flood in your lungs, or this is like a bushfire. There's all these metaphors that are like this of internal weather patterns in a way right um and i think it begin it reminds us it starts to get our literacy in systems thinking happening again and i think that the the most there's one you know those traditions um and, and i'm a practitioner of those traditions have some important way think tools to add to our clinical practice and that's fantastic i think it's really important but the most exciting thing to me is not that is not adding in 
astragalus alongside antibiotics, you know, or instead of antibiotics. I think that it is the um, getting literate once again in thinking in terms of systems because we have to, because what's killing us is our inability to see systems, is our inability to see the forest for the trees, our inability to see that we've been breeding COVID-19 for decades and we're breeding the next five as it goes along. <laughs> so I think that's the, the primary value of those traditions is that they preserve a, an epistemology from a different culture. And that epistemology was a way of gaining knowledge about the world that was based upon seeing things as connected. That's the primary value, I think, that's in traditional medicine. Integrative thinking knits our neural networks together. Great. Just using some of that system thought, maybe there's a question here. It says, can you comment on modern overcrowding such as low paid workers, uh, housed in dormitories, refugee camps, shanty towns, etc., in the context of this pandemic and the question around social reforms. So it's how do you change those kind of systems where people have got, you know, been forced together so much or in poverty? Um, well, um, I mean, these are some of the very hard problems of our generation, right? So first I need to flag, you know, I'm Jimmy <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I'm a healthcare practitioner, um, but I'm, I'm happy to have a crack at them, right? Um, so right. as healthcare practitioners, we do know that there's a strong relationship between overcrowding and infectious disease. Um, and so we got some fairly good models with TB and overcrowding. I think there's some formulas that you can kind of arrive at, which is like once it's more than, you know, four people per room, per dwelling in any environment, then you get X point increase in tuberculosis rate in that community, right? Um, so there is, there's, there's a definite relationship there. Um, and so on the one hand, we need physicians whose day job is, you know, helping those people with TB with whatever medicines they have rolling up their sleeves at the end of a day's work and commenting that my medicines alone, the clinical practice of medicine will never end TB. So Sir William Osler, who's a name that we all remember, a giant in medicine, Dr. Osler uh, uh, from the 19th century, he said tuberculosis is a social disease with a medical aspect. A social disease with a medical aspect that was of tuberculosis an overcrowding piece so we could say the same thing diabetes it's a social disease with a medical aspect chronic disease heart disease it's a social disease with a chronic mm. with a with a medical aspect that's why you used to have to be rich to afford a heart attack. Now you have to be rich to avoid one. It's chronic diseases are predominantly in lower economic back, uh, communities. The bar, vast majority, bulk of those of that disease burden lays there. Um, yes. Great. Look, one of the things I was going to bring up, and maybe I can relate it to another question that comes in. One of the things I was going to ask you about the the need for a kind of global soul searching to, to, to really understand where we need to, who we are and what we need to do. And that's a big question, but I'll, I'll throw, see if we can tie it into this. Um, uh, where did he go? Um, it says, what can we do in addition to working on physical aspects such as our own immune systems, our own, uh, in terms of working on our own consciousness, um, the point of attraction to all that is. This includes doing relevant shadow work, and creating the reality in our own small and collective way. So going again, probably what you've already talked a bit about, going from a kind of victimhood, disempowerment, to a creative, positive process. Um, but I guess yes. I, what I took from that is the whole consciousness. So um, I, I think that the, um, the tendency, th these, are, these are great questions, the tendency in in something like this pandemic that we have at the moment, um, when there's just so much uncertainty, it's very hard for anyone 
to get a clear sense of what's going on a lot of the time, right? We've got so much information and misinformation, so many reputable uh, sources saying one thing and then reputable sources saying the other thing. You know, it's very, very difficult. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of uncertainty. And in the midst of that uncertainty, there's a lot of fear. And in the midst of fear and uncertainty, the tendency is to, to, get, to grab a hold of something. It's like we're drowning in a fast flowing flash flood. It's like, quick, let's grab a hold of something. And you see this, you know, grab a hold of certainty, grab a hold of a narrative of what, what this is and what we need to do. And, and that's often grabbed a hold of through our amygdala <laughs> when we're looking at things from a, from a, a, a fear response. And, um, and, and there's often as well a kind of blaming. That's the problem. That's the problem. It's that. It's the boat people. No, it's the Chinese people. No, it's the pharmaceutical companies. No, it's the, <laughs> the government's cracked it. You know, there's a lot of blaming, right? There's an enormous amount of blaming. Or even you could say, Jimmy, you're doing this now. It's modernity, right? It's modernity. You're just blaming the whole thing in some way. When I, when I hear the soul searching piece, you know, and the consciousness, then that's what, that's what happened with Sojanitsyn. And that's what happens with, with Jung and a range of other people when we talk about shadow work, is the, the deep realisation that those unhealthy viral memes are within us and that the unhealthy social structures or the unhealthy responses are symptoms of something that we uh, uphold and have within us so shadow work is 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 taking that you know is, is taking ownership of that and cleaning out your own backyard getting your own room in order in a way right getting your own state of affairs in in order seeing the way in which my lens is cracked right rather than coming into this place of of the the victim and blaming piece right where there's always this, there's a good guy and a bad guy and we tend to we, we all tend to do this, right? It doesn't matter which good guys and bad guys you pick, <laughs> you know? It's the same meme underneath it, which is a simplistic and childlike idea of causality rather than seeing that the, those things start to get just tragic and blurred together. And there's an ambivalence of causality at that level. When you look at, you know, an, uh, an Indigenous man, uh, perhaps... Uh, say domestic violence with an indigenous woman, then it's very easy for us, hopefully in this conversation, not to go into blaming and calling him a perpetrator, right? He, he is himself a victim and that trauma is just moving around and it's tragic, right? And so when we see what's happening at the moment on the, the world scale, stage, we need a similar kind of lens, a lens that holds compassion and um, that moves away from looking for good guys and bad guys here to be able to see the tragic circumstances and then to identify how we participate in them. Lovely. Um, I might just read out a little comment from Margaret New because she, she's come up with a word that I found, which, oh, is it gone? Yeah, which I'd never heard of before. So it's oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, which says we need to step back into mindfulness, mindfulness, and take the helicopter view of how the macroplasm affects the microplasm, uh, as within, so without, and look at the pattern of happening around us, so that we can reflect some of that pattern about ourselves, our thoughts, emotions, behaviour. That through that we can grow and transform ourselves. So it's about really identifying. I think she's saying the the shadow work and converting those through. But I just like those words, um, micro and macroplasm too. Um, yes. Do you want to comment on that? Um, the thing that just came to mind was just the very, very personal experience of when, when COVID really sort of struck my world and I became aware that something big was happening. Um, my first response that lasted quite a few weeks was to um, essentially just to, to try to get the supplies that I needed to be able to continue practicing, right? And so what I did first was really take care of my own. And, and in one regard, you can say, well, you know, put your own uh, respirator on first and then help the person next to you. And, 
And there's an argument for that. But in the other regard, I, I really see how, um, I really see how the fragmented lens comes through and that there's a, attempts at times for myself to just kind of draw the, put the, put the drawbridge up. And it took me three or four weeks before I opened a community immunity hub in my local community and just started distributing free medicines to people at risk. It took me like almost a month before that initiative took place. And now that it has taken place, I'm aware that that was very much a secondary response for me. And the primary response was, I can be safe if I, you know, myself. And I, I think if we're going to sort out what's going on on the planet here, and we're going to sort out some of the ways in which our culture is, because there's some terrifying possibilities of what happens in the, in the political environment in the, in the following COVID, right? We're all aware of that. Is that if we're going to try to either avert those kind of gulag archipelago futures, then I think we really do need to do that. It, it does need to start at home. <laughs> it really needs to start at home, which is what I think some of the, where, where, what I get from some of those other statements about the macro, the micro and, you know, shadow and consciousness. Right. And I think that's good. I'll, uh, just another shorter question, uh, more specific. It says, many people are relating COVID-19 to other diseases throughout history, su history, such as the other SARS and the Spanish flu. Uh, but with that, what disease is the coronavirus the most similar to in terms of how it's affecting us, do you think? In terms of what's its overall patterning, do you think? Um, Thank you, Peter. There's, a, there's areas that there's ways in which I'm not qualified to um, answer that, right? So um, as a specialist in um, infectious diseases and all this sort of stuff, I would just get it wrong if I uh, compared it to some other disease at, the, at, at, the, at a, a clinical level. But um, the, the effect of the Black Death, right, was... Hmm clinically completely different to COVID, right? But psychologically, it rocked Europe, right? It rocked Europe profoundly. And it, it, co it caused a, a range of ripples that later gave rise to tidal waves in terms of how we did science, how we did religion, you know, how we organised the state there's all sorts of different pieces that start to, started to come out of, out of that. And I, I think that the thing that is most significant about COVID is not, you know, the scarring that it does to the lungs or, you know, anything like that, you know. I don't think it's actually the clinical picture that is most significant. I think it's the, the political and social shock that it's given, the way in which it's held a mirror up of like, wow, wow, the, our systems are vulnerable. Wow, we're all connected. Oh my goodness, you know, this, is this a trial run for, you know, larger scale climate change in 20 years or is this actually climate change right now? You know, there's this, the, the, the bigger, uh, the, when 911 happened in America, my deep hope at that time was that America was gonna say, whoa, why would anyone want to do that to us and had a long, hard look in the mirror and sat down and done some soul searching. Right. And I don't know what the answer to that soul searching would be, but just that it was a deeply introspective process and politically, at least on the world stage, it just viralized <laughs> America. We saw the bushes and all that sort of, you know, we saw Bush and all that sort of thing. And, I would really like COVID. I, COVID is giving that sort of shake and it's up to us of what happens on the other side of whether like America in the wake of 911, there's a kind of clutching, you know, and there's a ossifying of the, the, the structures of power and that we all get a little bit more fearful and a little bit more distant from each other. And we all draw up the drawbridge a little bit more and we hoard a little bit more toilet paper and a little bit more, I don't know, flour and rice under our beds or whether we just say, wow, you know, oh, what's the world that we want to live in? 
where are we going? What are we bequeathing to our children? You know, that's, and that's what I think that's the disease comparison. It's like, it has the potential to be like the black death, a strong psychological shock, like a breakdown. Fantastic. Look, Jimmy, um, you've taken us, uh, as I recall, through from hunter gatherers to post industrial society. You've looked at all sorts of things, including the importance of systems theory of um, looking at our own self involvement, self empowerment, soul searching, a whole raft of things. What would you like to, can you somehow put it together as a model of how, of the change you would like to see in just a, a, a few words? That's a challenge, but I, I think for the purposes of today's discussion and with the audience, I think that the, the real virus is the viral meme of the lens of fragmentation a fragmented lens of how we see ourselves and how we see the world. And the medicine is not solar panels. It's not cleaner oil. It's not new antibiotics. It's not uh, Bitcoin, right? The medicine is integrative thinking. You know, it's, it's healing the clack, the, the, that crack because it's that crack at the root of it all that doesn't see the connections that is the real illness here. And integrative physicians are trying to say what's actually going on here, you know, to go beyond the symptoms, right? To go beyond the symptoms. And we, this is what is required for all of us and for our, our whole culture is to, to, to bring back together that right and left brain and the range of those ways so that we can see ourselves and our part in this amazing drama and this wonderful cosmos that we're all children of. And that's so wonderful, Jimmy. I've truly enjoyed this evening. It's been a wonderful conversation. I um, hope others have enjoyed it a lot. I've noticed a lot of comments that I haven't had time to respond to, but I appreciate them. There have been some great gems of wisdom stated on the comment part, which we just didn't have time to cover. But I think for this evening, we've done a huge amount of work, and I would like to thank everyone involved. And uh, to suggest that you look at the AIMA website and become aware of any future webinars that will be happening, usually on a Thursday rather than a Tuesday. And this one will also be recorded, so it's available later on. But once again, thank you to Jimmy Wallombin. Thank you, indeed. <laughs> thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been wonderful. And I appreciate your apothecary in the background. It looks fabulous. <laughs>